We're going to be uh, talking about designing your private and hybrid cloud today. My name is Bob Sayer. I'm the CTO at Redapt, and I've got my colleague <coughs> Jeff Dickey here who runs our cloud group. Um, Redapt is a company that sells both hardware and integration services around building out private clouds and hybrid clouds. So we're a partner at RightScale. We are doing some work on some majorly large private and hybrid clouds today, and so we've gotten pretty good at the concepts of scale out, building out the infrastructure, delivering fully integrated racks essentially so that we can build and deliver a either sort of templated out of the box concept or a customized concept of a private and hybrid cloud into an infrastructure. So today we're going to talk about um, what we learned about that and uh, just hopefully share some information about what you might need to think about if you're going to go about building a private and or a hybrid cloud. So I'm going to hand the microphone over to Jeff and then I'll be back up here in a minute to talk about some other stuff. Thank you, Bob. Thank you everyone for, for joining for our little talk here. So we're we're all at the, uh, the right scale conference, so I'm just going to make some assumptions that everyone has a good understanding. We don't have to go over some of these buzzwords and play the, uh, the cloud bingo here. Um, so we'll just get right started and I'll, I'll, I'll do the overview with you. We're going to talk a little bit about hybrid clouds, sizing, the infrastructure and architecture, the build. Then Bob's going to talk about arch architecting your applications and the next steps. So what, what is hybrid? Um, you guys have probably heard a lot in the last year and, and, and this conference about hybrid. Um, many people are trying to get that, that perfect balance of, of, of the hybrid cloud and it's you know, the combination of public and private together. And it's, it gives you the benefits of, of, of both those, those clouds. We all know what the benefits of the public cloud, that anytime, anywhere, that self-service model, it's, it's basically credit card computing, right? Credit card infrastructure. And it's just it's so easy to do and, and businesses are really, uh, are really going for that and, and going outside the box and going outside their infrastructure to do that. Um, but there's, there's a few things that, that they're missing with that and that's what the private cloud brings. So, so our customers, we have a lot of customers that have some pretty heavy Amazon installs. And when you get up into the hundred to $200,000 a month Amazon range, there becomes this kind of balance where you know, it, made a, it was a really, really good decision to start in the cloud, and now we've outgrown it. We haven't outgrown the features, we haven't outgrown the usability or the bursting capabilities, but you know, we're, we're, we're maturing and we want control, we want better security, we want performance, and most of all, we want to lower our operating costs for our infrastructure. So we have a lot of customers that come to us with that bill and we kind of look at it and, and work on architectures for, for those two to talk together. That, public, private. Um, so, so that's hybrid cloud. So what, what's the future look like? The hybrid cloud is, is, is basically resource zones. It's, 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 you're going to have a zone here, a zone there, and it's about allocating your resources between those zones. Well, the future is going to be having multiple zones everywhere, but instead of resource pools and balancing between those resource pools, you're going to see it as one pool in different locations. So we kind of want to, you know, when we're designing these, these private clouds, you may not ever want to burst. You may not ever want to have uh, external private clouds um, or the, the, the off, off, you know, the, the uh, private or, or um, off-site kind of stuff. You know, if you have two locations and you may not want to burst between your own private locations, but you still want to have this in mind because it's going to be, it's really easy to do up front. It's very difficult to do in the back end. And we really see right scale as that single interface for that federated cloud management. So managing all of your resources. Size does matter a lot in designing your hybrid cloud. This is the, the first question we get from everyone we talk to, is we want to do something, we have a budget, we don't know where to start, we don't know how much gear we need. We, we know we need infrastructure, but it sounds complex. We have a lot of legacy gear, we have a lot of you know, cloud workloads um, at Rackspace, at Amazon, but we don't know where to start. So we, we help our customers size those. Uh, everyone kind of has similar apps out there, but everyone has unique workloads. They have different CPU and memory footprints. Their applications have a different, different footprint. So this is kind of an example of some of the stuff we use as a reference architecture to say, hey, uh, here's a lot of the stuff we see. Here's how to map it to virtual CPUs. Let's um, figure out what kind of gear you want and map the virtual CPUs to physical infrastructure on your cloud pods. And we can tell you 
what you need and, and why. Existing workloads are very important because most of the time in your private cloud, you have those. You have them in your data center, you have them somewhere, and we want to go look at that footprint so we can see how much uh, storage and compute we need. Sizing for unknown and future apps are a little bit easier because we have the math done for Amazon. We can, we can take uh, your Amazon bill and size that for a private cloud, and then we can, we can, we'd like to use this kind of small, medium, large uh, model as well for uh, future deployments. So this way you kind of know how to do chargeback and you know how to size your infrastructure and you know what equals what, and that's pretty easy. So next we're going to talk about that private cloud architecture. So the key is, and this, this is kind of even an old, uh, an old thing here, this goes back to the original idea of virtualization, but it's the shared infrastructure. You really want to leverage shared infrastructure, especially when you're starting your cloud, because you're going to lower that operating cost. You want to think of siloing your shared infrastructure in a multi-tenant fashion as if you were a service provider, because you are going to be a service provider for uh, other groups in your company or other applications. You're going to mix and match, and I'll show in a second how we kind of silo those out. This is the typical pod architecture we see in doing our private clouds. And here's an example of how we carve that out. So you see you have shared infrastructure but we will silo out a public burst, so for web applications that use right scale to burst out, but we can also physically or virtually isolate secure applications, legacy workloads on that infrastructure. And you can choose what you want to do with the storage. You can do the same thing with isolating the storage, or you can have storage pods inside that cloud pod. And this is how we scale. So once you have those pods set up, it's very easy to scale out. That's a lot of compute, a lot of storage, and not very much overhead. Um, the, the, this is kind of the future of what we're seeing inside these pods is, is orchestration of the bare metal. So we want to we design this infrastructure so that you can dynamically go between hypervisors and bare metal OSs. Um, it's a big goal for a lot of the folks we're working with. And we're getting really close to having that nailed down. But you know, I want to talk about this because you know, keep this in mind when you're designing. Um, if you have 1,000 servers, you might be able to dynamically overnight mix the workloads and go from hypervisors to Hadoop in, you know, in a matter of seconds and balance out your workloads. So this is the uh, kind of putting it all together. First, you want to select your cloud platform. We're, we're, we're in a really interesting place right now because we have, uh, at minimum, four really good options, mature options, to select from uh, both open source, commercial, and then both open source and commercial together. So what do you need? It's fairly simple. Some compute, storage, some networking, and some spare time that everyone has. So what do you do next? How do we, how do we start? We want to find gear, and if, if, if anyone here has a data center or something, there's, there's going to be some usable gear out there. And what we do is, is, is we help our customers do some capacity management, and we look and we find those targeted cloud applications, cloud workloads. We isolate the OS from the apps. We look at the bare metal, what everything's doing, and we find out where that gear is and where we can pull that out. So you don't have to buy new gear to start this cloud. You can have build a test environment with, with gear, and at the same time, you've, you've isolated what apps are going to be cloud ready, what OSs are cloud ready, what workloads, you know. Um, so we're going to find that, that underutilized <coughs> hardware. If you can't find the gear, you can buy it. It's out there. Um, popular server we see out there are the, are the SLED servers, where there are two U's, and they've got four servers in it. You know, dual socket, 48 gigs of RAM, so they're out there, and um, it's very easy to find the gear. Um, I'll briefly talk about the network architecture real quick. You know, this is a standard network architecture. Um, what we see for starting out, especially on the, the private cloud, is, is you, know, you kind of want to mimic the other public providers, and they have very flat networks. Um, so you want to design that, especially for starting out. Very flat, it's very fast, it's, it's, it's simple, and it's uh, low cost. Um, so the, the next part of that is the uh, cloud operation and management. And I'm going to bring up Bob Sarah, CTO, to uh, finish that. 
Okay, so um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about is is once you have your infrastructure designed and built out, like Jeff just talked about, there's more to it than that. You want to be able to think about what what you do with your infrastructure, and and when you think about your private cloud, it's not all about um, your infrastructure architecture, at that point you have to think about application ar architecture. You have to think about what you want to get out of it. And so one of the things that we spend a lot of time on with our customers is, you know, everyone will come in and say, hey, I need to be in the cloud. Or um, if you, you know, we're in the keynote this morning, you think about the fact that the cloud already exists in your organization and you don't even know it yet. But one of the things that we try to do is to think about, let's, let's really take a step back and think about the the cloud as an investment just like any other IT investment that you might make and when you think about that investment you want to certainly identify business priorities that you're going to try to accomplish and so you have to think about what are those priorities and what you want to achieve and then from there you can really tailor where you want to go from that anyways so some of the things that uh, that you want to think about when you're you're building out your cloud or designing it or if you started the implementation and you're trying to figure out where to go next are Certainly, um, I like to think of this from any, anybody who's building out an application, you need to build it for the future. And so the problem that a lot of people have is when you start small, you think, I just need to get it done, right? And so you're going to start on something, someone's going to grab some resources, they're going to build it out, and they're not going to think about the future. And next thing you know, you've got a big mess to clean up. So from day one, if you think about, uh, okay, you know, I get it. Maybe you want to share, share or save on some costs, and so you want to try to eliminate some of the components. But, but I think from day one, you really need to think about a management layer that goes on top of this. RightScale is awesome for that. You guys have seen the demos. Um, we've worked through that. I think that even if you're getting started on a small private cloud offering where you have a single resource pool, then you are probably still going to benefit from having a really nice management layer that goes on top of that because it'll force you into the mode of having templated approaches toward delivering your services and really thinking about automating everything you do in that infrastructure so that you don't ever do a lot of manual stuff which is very difficult to recreate down the road and i guarantee that everyone's going to have to recreate it whether it's moving from dev to test or test to staging or staging to production or now you want to make it dr ready those are all things that require templated instantiations or instantiations of templates and different resource pools and things like that so other things that you want to think about are DevOps and automation. The, um, in one of the presentations earlier today, I think it was the guy from CBS was talking about um, never splitting sort of your dev and your ops. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, but then also you want to think about monitoring, both reactive and proactive. The reactive piece is um, a little bit of, you, you can get some of that built into the, uh, from the right scale layer. You may want to add other components in there, or maybe you want to do some proactive monitoring and use something like uh, Nagios or Ganglia or something like that to, to monitor your systems and, and, uh, and be able to be proactive about outages or resource constraints or maybe disks are getting full or things like that. And so that's all part of managing the infrastructure regardless of where it sits. And then the self-service portal piece is important because y especially when you're dealing with a private cloud infrastructure, you, you want to have some control. I don't, the, the gentleman who is um, from Maine who is, who is the analyst was talking this morning about how you actually really don't have control. You might think you do, but you're, you're um, in IT these days, it kind of goes from the bottom up. Your developers are choosing the platforms they're going to want to run on. But, one place where that can change is if you make it really, really easy for people to, 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 to develop on a certain platform. So if you're a CIO or a director or whatever and you're trying to control what people are doing in your organization and you built a really nice self-service portal that funneled them into the platforms that you want to use, then all of a sudden it becomes easy for them to do that and that's where they're going to end up. And then the chargeback and the billing piece is something that's important as well. So when, when you're sitting down and defining your, your business requirements for building out your private and hybrid cloud, these are some of the things that you'll want to consider and these will all end up affecting the architecture and how you build out your system. So a lot of times what we see today are um, of the list that I just presented, these are the most important. And so we talk to a lot of customers today that, that ask us, okay, hey, you know, I get it, the public cloud is interesting and I can have fully elastic demand and I want to be in there because I want to scale out. But, um, but other guys come to us and say, hey, you know what, I don't, I don't actually want to be in the, in the public cloud because I'm afraid of it, because of security constraints or whatever reasons they are. And I know that there, there are ways to, to get through those issues, but a lot of people want the, the private cloud or, 
or a hybrid cloud or even a private cloud with multiple resource pools that they own completely or have full control of because of the three things listed up here. Things like DevOps or chargeback or building out dev and test clouds. So I'm going to talk through those in a little bit of detail. So on the DevOps side, uh, we get a lot of this where you'll go in and talk to a company and they'll say, I don't, I'm not interested in the cloud. And, um, and you'll say, really, are you sure? Because I think what happens today is you probably have a bunch of dev teams that are out there doing projects. And what is that like today? Um, the other thing we heard this morning is, I think uh, we raised some hands about how long does it take to provision servers? And everyone knows what that's like, right? It could be months, it could be weeks, it could be months, who knows? And so you have a team that comes through and says, I got a project that I want to do and we're going to do it on a LAMP stack or whatever, and I need a bunch of servers to do this, and I'm going to start out with uh, you know, X number of dev servers, and I'm ready to go. Next thing you know is I need a bunch of test servers, and by the way, I'm going to do some load testing. And then from my load tests, I want to move into a staging environment, and from there, then I want to move into some kind of a production environment, and then, oh, by the way, I want to be able to do some kind of uh, DR environment as well, so I want to replicate a lot of the components, maybe in different regions. So all of these things are... Um, can be handled on the DevOps side. If you look at this chart right here, it's kind of interesting. We, um, you, in terms of num amount of time spent by IT, spending around 30% of deployment um, of your time on deployment management, or um, we like to look at it as um, I, there was a there was a Forrester report that said something like IT managers or IT staff are spending something like 60, 70, 80 percent of their time on basic management of the resources. And so one of the things that we like to think about is DevOps is a way to become a lot more agile, to become a lot more innovative, to become a lot quicker in how people can uh, provision resources in their organization where you can take control of those resources and, um, and do it in a way that's really flexible and agile for your organization. And so just like the guy from CBS was talking about this morning, you don't want this wall that sits in between development and operations. You don't want the developers out there thinking, I want new things, I want to have, uh, have a system that's pretty quick because I want to be innovative and I want to be agile and everyone's doing agile development methodologies, but yet the way they provision resources is not agile in any way. And so at the end of the day, it's all about being more innovative, reducing cycle times, but yet still giving the operations people control of the environment so that they can have some level of standardization. And that's, that's where the DevOps piece comes in. And so ultimately, if you do this right, with the, the right level of, of considerations built around the DevOps piece, then you can take your IT people and have them be maybe spending 40 to 50% of their time on management or maybe even 30% and the rest of it is, is all around innovation. And so next thing you know, the, um, the operations people are contributing to the company being more innovative down the road. So back to my original point on this is, is we, we've seen this a million times where we go into customers and, and we talk to them about a public cloud or a cloud in general and they say, no, not interested. And we say, well, okay, how about converting over the way that you guys provision resources into a DevOps environment? And all of a sudden it starts becoming interesting because you're talking about just provisioning resources and becoming a little more agile and becoming quicker and spending less time building out VMs that you never reclaim or bare metal um, hardware that you never reclaim after the projects are done. So the second piece that we like to focus on is the chargeback model. So on the, um, you think about it, everyone knows about this on the public cloud side because it's pretty obvious, right? You're getting a bill for your use, it's number of cents per hour, it's pretty obvious on how many resources you're using and when you need to take those resources offline so that you can stop spending that money or when you need to ramp up and spend a little more money and get a little more for your money. But on the, on the internal private cloud side, well, what if you could do the same thing? So we always like to say that the IT teams, it would be great if, they, if they're not actually really thought of as a cost center anymore. Because what if when they're building out the infrastructure for their DevOps, what if they do it in such a way so that it is actually just a pool of resources? And what if that pool of resources can be provisioned on demand, essentially, through a self-service portal? And then what if you could meter the usage of that over time? And you could charge it back to the business units that are using it. So you know exactly where the resources are being used. You know exactly where the spend is coming from. You know exactly how to essentially build a revenue model around what used to be a complete cost center. Granted, it's still funny money on the inside of the organization because you're, you're shifting money from one place to another. But at least you can build a model around the infrastructure that you need to deploy based on essentially your market. And your market is your internal development staffs. So um, 
I like this idea of making it an IT revenue center and doing it through a self-service model with the right level of metering and billing and chargeback that goes with it. And then the other piece of it is, is again, thinking back to the DevOps model is, is thinking of it from a development cloud concept. So one of the things that when, when Jeff and I sit around and talk about using a hybrid cloud model for building robust application infrastructures, um, we all know the concept of a dev environment and a staging environment. So when you're building out an environment, if you're going to use a public cloud to deploy your infrastructure into because you want, for example, the elastic demand, or maybe you want to take advantage of a couple of different geographic regions. We were talking to a customer earlier today who, because of um, data locale constraints, there are some countries that will require you to keep your sensitive data within that country, for example. And so you may be required to deploy into uh, Amazon in Ireland, for example. But either, either way, there's no reason why you can't take ownership of that development infrastructure. And there's no reason why you can't build out essentially a development private cloud that models your production private cloud. RightScale is a great way to do this because you can, you can use your server templates that are essentially deployable inside of Amazon or inside of your, your private cloud built on CloudStack, for example, or Eucalyptus or something like that. So you can very easily build out server templates which you can deploy into your development cloud and then when you're ready to go you can just spin up those same instances into wherever your production cloud may be. You may have a split for example between what goes on in the dev side because of the hypervisor configuration that you need and maybe what goes on in the in the in the in the in the production environment. So if you think about in a, an example of this, this diagram we actually um, I think this is a diagram we grabbed well, it says source Citrix, but you see this actually um, in a lot of the, uh, the right scale training that we do. And your application infrastructure tends to be very scale out and very sort of redundant and all the components for the most part are ephemeral, right? If one of them crashes, you don't care. You've got a master and a slave database configuration. But what if you had an application that was not this way? What if you had an application that needed to um, have a VM that would be persistent or never die. So you need a different hypervisor. You, you can't just have the service die and spin another one up. You actually need to have the state replicated and have the, the VM take care of that. And in that case, you might want to build out a dev cloud that is on a, an ephemeral or non-persistent hypervisor, whereas your production cloud may be something a little more, more, more robust. So, um, but the key piece is if you do this all through server templates, if you do this all through a management layer, um, if you automate as much as possible, then you should be able to pretty easily replicate your development cloud into your test cloud, into your production cloud, and from a developer or a test perspective, it's all the same, really. You're dealing with the same interfaces. Okay, so um, some of the keys to successes are when you're building out these robust dev and test clouds, or actually, I, I should say, one of the keys to success for building out a private cloud is to make sure that you have a robust dev and a test cloud. So. So some of the checklists are um, make sure that you have essentially a future ready dev cloud. And what I mean by that is to make sure that you have, um, you have to think about your deployment. You have to think about where you want to end up. You have to think about uh, architecting your dev cloud so that it mimics what your production cloud will be. And so in a lot of cases, we like to recommend building out a private cloud that, mim that mimics your, your public cloud. It, you don't need to do it this way. Um, I think it's a good way to do it because you, you um, I, I, I think just thinking of it in terms of different resource pools that, that you can utilize um, that have different levels of service, for example, or different charge models where you might, uh, if you're taking ownership of your dev ops, for example, it's a really nice way to build out a private cloud to do development and then be able to easily take those server templates and move them into production. So the, the idea of testing or proof of concepts for your production cloud or production hybrid cloud, if you're, if you're going to deploy in a hybrid cloud model for whatever reason you want to deploy into a hybrid cloud for, so for example, elastic demand, then, then obviously building in your dev environment or your test environment in, in a place where you have those two different resource pools is going to be very important. You don't want to have to do this in production for the first time. Um, and so you just want to make sure that you have your infrastructure sort of mimicked as closely as possible to what you'll have in your, in your production environment. I'm going to spend the next couple of slides talking about application considerations. And um, the reason is because when we think about building out private clouds or actually hybrid clouds in general, there are 
many considerations that need to be taken into account for making sure that your architecture can, can actually run in the infrastructure that you build. So, so one of the things that, that I think is, is really important to think about, and if anybody goes and spends a lot of time on Amazon site, and they have a lot of their best practices for building out clouds or private clouds or public clouds, you'll see a lot of the same information in there. And, it, and you'll see this on Rackspace's site. You'll see this in, in almost any one of the um, cloud vendors or providers. But what we see time and time again is you can spend all day and all night building out a scalable infrastructure. But if you don't have an application that scales, then it doesn't matter. So if you think about it, there's a lot of um, cases, and I'll show some examples of this, but where you can build out the, the biggest infrastructure ever, right? But if your application isn't architected to take advantage of it, then it really doesn't matter. So we like to, to bring this up because in a lot of cases when people are building out a private cloud, they're doing it because they want to migrate applications over from legacy systems. Whether it's a virtualized system or a bare metal system, they may be moving applications into a cloud construct. And, and so this is where you, you kind of need to think about the architecture and maybe actually do a little bit of refactoring for that architecture. And then the other piece of it is design for failure as much as possible, right? You want a robust infrastructure, and so you have to assume that components are going to fail. And if you design with the expectation that every component will fail, then you'll have a system that is robust for that failure, right? If something dies then, and, and you're able to very easily recover, then you've done a good job of designing your system. So when we think about scalable applications, and, and again, the reason that I bring this up is because you're using your public, your private cloud and your hybrid cloud to build out scalable and robust applications. And so what we like to do when we, when we say, all right, now, now that you've thought about this infrastructure and you're going to build out this infrastructure, let's think about applications that can actually run in this infrastructure. Let's think about applications that can take advantage of the infrastructure we just built. And so we, we like to think about the characteristics of what is exactly a scalable application. What, what can actually take advantage of this? And so there's a couple of key characteristics of this. One is increasing resources results in increasing performance, right? So, um, and, and we like to make that as linear as possible if we can, so that you know that you can scale out, right? It's, it's the scale out concept versus the scale up concept, which is something that is um, inherent in any cloud infrastructure. We want to be able to handle heterogeneous environments. So um, again, you think about the fact that you're going to use multiple resource pools, or you may build um, many different uh, locations or instance types, for example, to handle your application. You want to have something that's operationally efficient. And so that actually comes down to automation. Right? Anybody who's been in through the, the right scale training classes, or you thought about, um, I think that uh, the CEO this morning talked about um, I guess he was mentioning this, that the CTO at RightScale was talking about cloud ready means it's API driven to some degree. So if you, if you build everything from the concept of we're going to write to APIs, we're going to automate through scripts, we're going to automate the deployments, that's an operationally efficient system and that type of system can, fit, that can scale because of that. We need to be resilient to network outages. So we don't know what's going to happen with the network and we need to be resilient to that. And then we also need to be more efficient as the service grows. So there's Historically speaking, you can think about um, contrasting approaches to scaling, one of which will suit or is suited by the cloud very well, and one isn't. Okay? So the concept of scaling up is not really that suitable to the cloud. This is sort of the, le the legacy. We're going to throw you know, more, more hardware with it. I heard the, um, the NoSQL guys talking about how MySQL is a scale-up architecture, whereas NoSQL is a scale-out architecture. That makes a lot of sense to me, right? So if you have an application that is built essentially without the consideration of the scalable application architecture, meaning that you're thinking about building it so that you can't throw more instances at it and have it run better, um, then, then, you, then you have a problem with it. And so that's, that's a failable architecture. And, and so what I mean by that is you know, if you have an application that needs a, a ton of RAM or we're going to throw more RAM at it or more disk or whatever else, that's a scale-up architecture. Whereas a scale-out scale architecture, this is actually supposed to say scale-out right here, um, this is something that can scale horizontally. So again, if you think about the, the right-scale examples of the server pools, right? you have the three-tier application with two load balancers, you've got the master and the slave database, and then you've got an application tier, which is a pool of resources, and those can spin up or down based on thresholds. That's a scalable architecture because it can scale out. 
And so when we go into companies and we talk about, all right, what's, what's a good example of an application that can take advantage of a hybrid cloud? And in a lot of cases, the hybrid cloud is going to be there for doing elastic demand. Well, that's, that's the kind of infrastructure we're going to look at. And if the infrastructure isn't built that way, then we might want to think about refactoring it and figuring out how to make it so that it is that way. The other thing that we like to think about is what exactly is elastic? So, so again, this comes back to the concept of who, who needs a public cloud, who needs a private cloud, who needs a hybrid cloud. Our customers today who are running hybrid clouds are typically customers who are doing web scale type stuff. They have unforecasted demand. They don't know when their, they're, I mean, well, they kind of know when their demand is going to hit, but they don't really know how big it's going to hit. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the tough part about that is that you might not be a web scale company, but I think you can probably still take advantage of peak performance or downgraded performance. And so you might want to think about if you're not web 2.0, you can still take advantage of off-peak resources, for example. And so you might want to say, all right, I'm going to build out a hybrid cloud because I'm going to have my core infrastructure run on my private cloud. But maybe I want to burst into the public cloud um, for things like night nightly builds or batch jobs. Or maybe I want to take resources that I have internally and use them for nightly builds and batch jobs. And then during the day, I'm going to have them process something different. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the way to think about leveraging your infrastructure that way. Um, so I'm just going to kind of summarize on the application side. So. Um, when you think about building out your private cloud, moving applications into that private cloud is easier, um, easier than you think. So it's, it's, uh, in, in a lot of ways, it's, um, you, you just want to think about, OK, I've already got an infrastructure there. Um, I've already figured out how to install that infrastructure. When I move it into my private cloud, I want to think about how to automate everything that I used to do manually, right? So that's writing scripts for all the installs, writing scripts for all of the load balance configurations, writing uh, maybe some additional server templates to, to be able to manage this in the right scale layer. Refactoring is, is a key component of this because once you have the scalable infrastructure, you want to be able to make sure that you have a scalable application to take advantage of that infrastructure. You want to think about your bottlenecks and tight coupling. So if you're going to leverage the scale out concept, then you want to see, you know, for example, are you doing a bunch of synchronous calls between your applications? And those could die, right? If one of the application components fails, then your whole system slows down. So what if you built queues in between those and decoupled those components? And then the other thing is, is data sources and, and figuring out what, what to do with those data sources and whether you need shared data sources or not. So these are all. These are all considerations when, once you have the infrastructure built, how do you get your applications moved into that cloud? So to wrap it up, um, we, uh, we like to joke around about the cloud because everything is in the cloud these days. And it's, uh, it's sort of like if you don't use the word cloud in conversation, then you're not cool. So um, I think that one of the things that we think about is everyone has questions of, do I need to be in the cloud? If I want to be in the cloud, how do I get there? And what we want to sort of leave you with is think big. So when you're building this out, just make sure that you think about what's going to happen if that application scales out very, very large. That's why Jeff talked about the, the pod concept of building out a pod-based infrastructure. Because you can build out those racks as small as you want. You can start with a couple servers. And once you have a couple servers, you can add more servers and have a rack. Once you have racks, you can add more racks. You can have sort of an N plus one approach where you start out building out your first rack, which is storage and networking, and then you can add compute for however many uh, levels that you need it. And so it's really just thinking about architecting so that when you get to where you need to be, you can handle the capacity. But, but obviously, you don't have to start big. You don't have to go out tomorrow and spend $500,000 building out um, you know, 10 racks of servers. You can start small. You can start with a couple servers. We have our guys back in the lab building out, um, as Jeff mentioned, you can find infrastructure that's already there. We happen to have a couple Dell RT10 sitting around and uh, an old Equalogic box for storage. And we built out a private cloud with it. And it's running CloudStack. And it took us you know, a, a day on the weekend to, to build it out. So, so you can literally get your, your private cloud up and running in probably two days, if you know what you're doing. And, um, and it's just a matter of getting advice from someone who's done it before. Um, we can help you with that. You can find resources, resources on the internet. Using something like capacity planning to figure out where your resource, resources are going to come from. Doing your vendor selection. Is it going to be eucalyptus, cloud.com? 
getting it up and running from there, and then uh, dropping the right scale management layer on top of it. So um, I end with a uh, fancy picture of right scale is my cloud, and then uh, for whoever was there last night, this is sort of what we do, which is our sort of XXL um, cloud in the box concept, where we can hook into that. And, uh, and it just, if anyone has any questions about how we build this out or what it looks like or anything like that, then please come up and, and talk to us. And, uh, and that kind of wraps it up. So thank you.